11.45, so let's begin. Uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, depending upon which time zone you're joining us from. Um, welcome to this webinar being organized jointly by the Water Channel and IIT Delft. We have been organizing these webinars uh, as a way of reaching out to former students of IIT, but also to the water sector at large. Uh, through the webinars, we share uh, from time to time the latest in water management research and education that is coming out of IHE and indeed from the Water Channel. Uh, the webinars are free to attend and open to all. We see some value in keeping these webinars open. We think that by engaging in a certain amount of sharing and exchange as opposed to buying and selling, the whole water sector benefits in a way which also benefits us as individual professionals and as organizations. Uh, we are happy to have at the webinar today um, someone who has been spearheading the idea of openness uh, in water education and in data-driven water management at large. He is Hans van der Quast, Senior Lecturer at the Department of Water Resource and Ecosystems at IIT. As a teacher, Hans uh, champions and promotes the use of open source tools for teaching and learning. Uh, as a specialist and in remote sensing and GIS, uh, he keeps promoting and developing tools and data sets that are open and accessible to a wide range of people who work in the water sectors, students, teachers, water managers, farmers, government organizations, and so on. So uh, the latest in this endeavor is a book called QGIS for Hydrological Applications, which he has co-written with Kurt Menke. I hope I uh, pronounced Kurt's name right. Um, and it is a book I would really recommend to all of us gathered here in this webinar. And I will just share the link to the book in this chat box. This is an Amazon, this is a link on Amazon, but the book is also available on several other platforms. Uh, so with that brief but hopefully sufficient introduction, I would like to hand things over to Hans himself. We look forward to hearing from him and learning about various opportunities for open source, source learning in water management that are out there, but hopefully also to understand a bit how does the open source ecosystem work? What incentives do creators of open source uh, material have? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, is the audio clear? Can everybody hear me? Okay, okay, so I'll just go ahead. So. I was saying in course of the webinar, we also <laughs> hope to um, uh, understand a bit how the open source ecosystem works, um, what incentives do creators of open source uh, teaching and learning material have to keep creating such material, if there is a business model underlying open source processes, and so is open source really the future of uh, learning. Before that, I would like to point out uh, some housekeeping stuff. We would like to keep this webinar interactive. So we invite you to keep sharing questions and comments that come to your mind during the webinar. You can do that uh, in this chat box here that you can see. Uh, we will keep collecting your questions and comments and discuss them during the Q&A session, which will follow Hans's main presentation. So without further ado, I would like to uh, hand things over to Hans. Hans, please take it away. Uh, so welcome everybody. Um, I think uh, the introduction uh, by Abraham was okay. I will uh, add a few more uh, things during the presentation. Um, you've seen these uh, poll questions on your screen, so if you haven't answered them yet, please uh, go ahead. We uh, use that also to uh, summarize in the end uh, a bit uh, the findings. Okay, so uh, welcome all, especially our uh, alumni. I've seen a lot of uh, familiar names around. Uh, great that you can attend. And I hope uh, uh, these slides will help you to, uh, to discuss with me at the end uh, the things related to open education. We need to distinguish a bit that open source is, uh, is used mainly for uh, source code, so open source software. Um, I had already a previous uh, webinar on open data. So in that case, we call it open data or open access. Um, and uh, this one is about open education for water professionals. And I made this presentation together with uh, Raquel dos uh, Santos and uh, Jipke Koster, who both work in the Education Bureau and uh, help me with uh, gathering statistics and advising on the presentation. Now, open education, we have heard about a lot of uh, terminology uh, in the last few years, like uh, MOOCs, open courseware, uh, e-learning, 
and uh, yeah, what does it mean and why are we doing it? So I would like to uh, pose a first question to you all, uh, like if you are a developer of courses, uh, why would you do, um, what is the most important objective you want to achieve with e-learning? So take a minute and you think about if you yourself uh, can distribute uh, educational materials, why would you choose for e-learning? What is the most important objective for you? See there, reach more people from faraway places. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. To learn uh, uh, at our pace and suitabilities. I think that's also a very good one. Cost effective. Yeah, could be. Let's see a few more. Affordability for students, yeah, especially if it's about open education. Access ideas at the global level, yeah, fantastic. Okay, I see the answers still coming in, very good. Uh, we will report those uh, after this uh, webinar uh, together with the, with the video. But uh, let's have a look at what others came up with in uh, during workshops that we had at IHC Delft. So I'm also coordinating e-learning with our partners. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can also contact me. It's uh, funded by the DOPC2 program. And uh, these things came up uh, with our meetings with, for example, Waternet. Um, increasing the impact by training more people on water-related topics. Improve the cost effectiveness, also mentioned by, by you as participants here, to um, reduce the needs for students to travel between different hosting universities. That happens, of course, a lot in our work, especially if you work in a network. Facilitate the sharing of educational materials between the partners, also very important, the sharing component. Um, also use it to update existing curricula. I'm going to talk a lot about uh, that, how, how you do that in a, in a proper way, in developing new innovative uh, curricula and attract more participants in that way. Um, organize professional uh, short course in an online format so uh, you can offer them much uh, more often than you do with the face-to-face -face courses. And there's also a quality control that you can do in another way, uh, which needs to be developed for online. It's always used as an excuse not to do it, but I think it's, it's an, there's also arguments to do it and improve the quality control uh, with different uh, e-learning approaches. Very important for you as uh, alumni is uh, with e-learning, we can also support more the lifelong learning. After graduation with IHE, it doesn't stop. Um, science develops, uh, insights in the world uh, develop. And it's good if we keep in touch with each other and uh, facilitate lifelong learning through uh, online participation. And it's green, also very important these days. Uh, I personally want to fly less for my work and I see that uh, uh, e-learning is a nice opportunity for me to organize trainings uh, in any place in the world without flying. <clears throat> and I think it's very important also for IHE uh, to reduce our uh, CO2 footprint. And in these days, we can even add to that. Uh, today, it came out in the news that 290 million uh, school children are kept home because of Corona. What if the schools and the facilities were there for, uh, for e-learning? Then uh, this time would not get lost and you could use it even as an opportunity to learn uh, new things through the internet. So a uh, lot of advantages of doing that. Here at IHC Delft, we have different modalities for uh, e-learning. Uh, we have... Um, uh, uh, professional diploma uh, courses that can also be used in uh, so-called blended learning mode. So you have face-to-face, uh, -face, which is then uh, mixed with uh, online components um, and uh, available on our website as online courses. There's also online courses at the master level, uh, which can also be used for lifelong learning. Um, we are thinking more to moving to shorter uh, courses instead of the full five ECTS ones. That also reduces the price, but we also think that there is a, um, more interest in shorter uh, components. And uh, I would be glad also to hear that from you in the discussion. So you, you can make some uh, remarks on that in the, in the chat window. Um, for these, you pay a tuition fee for these first two, and we target their uh, professionals, which already have a, a bachelor level and uh, uh, are proficient in English. We also test that. 
Then there are MOOCs, there's open courseware, open educational resources and webinars like that, uh, like these that are uh, offered for free, uh, where MOOCs we, we could offer also a small fee for a certificate, if you want a certificate. So there are different open uh, modalities available. So we had a nice uh, MOOC from uh, Afri Alliance. I'll come back to that later. We had uh, webinars, several ones like, like these. Here you see an example uh, in cooperation with the Australian Water School where we all were in different parts of the world. Um, and we have open educational resources such as my uh, YouTube channel uh, on uh, GIS, for example. But what does open really mean? Well, there's a clear definition of open that's also used for open source software or open data. Uh, so here this, the definition talks about data, but you can imagine also other kind of uh, resources. Uh, a piece of data is open, not only if everybody is free to use it, but also reuse it and redistribute it. And there can only be two restrictions to that. That is to attribute to the source. So if I put my materials as open courseware uh, on the web, then and you want to reuse it, then you need to attribute, you need to say that it comes from, from Hans van der Krust from IHC Delft. And another restriction you could put on that is uh, share alike, which means that everybody who derives things from this has also to put an open license on it and share it in an open way. Then there are several licenses you can put on your um, open courseware or on your uh, courseware in general. And uh, these are the completely open licenses. It's a very uh, boring topic, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We call this also copyleft as a contrast with copyright. And um, I think it's very important that you know that these ones are the real open licenses. But in general, we use different ones. Also at IHC Delft, we don't use the real open license, but we use uh, the Creative Commons non-commercial license, CC by NC. Also this presentation is licensed CC by NC. And this means that everybody in the world can uh, use these materials for free, but you're not allowed to make your own business out of that. So that means that universities abroad uh, are free to use my materials. I don't have a problem. It's always good to ask. Uh, but if you're going to give paid courses commercially, then uh, yeah, then we have a problem. So uh, it's very important that if you develop uh, course materials, that you license it in a proper way and that you know why you put a certain license on that. And uh, of course, we want to spread knowledge, but we don't want to build uh, the business too much uh, in, uh, for others without getting uh, revenues ourselves. So then um, we have the traditional course development at IHC where we start with our MSc module. So the lecturers here develop uh, lots of course materials for uh, master modules that are taught here at IHC Delft face to face. And then some of these courses become available as uh, short courses uh, that you can uh, join here at IHC uh, also. And uh, sometimes we get specific ref uh, requests to, um, to make courses for, for customers that can be uh, government or private sector. There's also uh, subsidies, for example, from uh, Nuffic to do that. And then we sell uh, parts of those existing modules as tailor-made trainings. That's the traditional way. It has some uh, disadvantages. Um, the first disadvantage is that teaching materials are mostly developed with subsidies because our education part uh, receives a lot of subsidy uh, money and uh, that part doesn't have many requirements to, to innovate. So there's no drive to innovate. I put it very black and white. Of course, it's up to the lecturer to innovate or not, but given this, uh, the, the money uh, that comes in for this, uh, th there's no real drive to innovate. Also, the scholarships that many of our participants uh, receive are not really an incentive to be competitive uh, with the market. The self-payers are more uh, driving the, the competitiveness, and that's increasing with the years, but uh, the scholarships aren't really doing that. And by packaging your uh, modules also as uh, short courses that externals can follow, you break the learning curve, because each time you get external uh, participants and you need to start over again, uh, with uh, teaching the basics, unless uh, you put a requirement there to follow uh, prep courses. We do have uh, requirements uh, to, to follow the courses, but it's very hard to test it. So there's a nice opportunity for, for e-learning to introduce their uh, prep courses. 
then uh, we got into this era where we need to do everything uh, online and uh, we see it in the strategies, but nobody really has a great vision on uh, why should we do it. So I call this uh, spaghetti. And this means that, uh, yeah, well, we start uh, from our MSC modules and we open parts online and we uh, produce different uh, online uh, stuff and all these arrows can be connected in a random way, but there's no real strategy behind this. Um, even not a, a business model, which is very important if we want to do it. So therefore, this first question uh, that I ask you, why should we do this? And that's very important. So now for something completely different, if you know Monty Python, this comes, of course, from Monty Python. What if we want to redesign our education based on these new insights of e-learning and using the, uh, the technology that is available these days? then we need to really look at um, different things that we know. So where does the money enter the system? And that is when we sell our tailor-made advice and training. So here in the liaison office, uh, our colleague uh, Mita is uh, coordinating our tailor-made training and advice where companies, government, um, anybody can request specific uh, trainings from our experts and uh, are willing to pay for that. And it's based on the market needs by definition which means that it gives us a billable time and a budget to develop the course materials. And in that way also is an opportunity to innovate and be the state of the art. So we should really use that to innovate in our teaching. Then what can we learn from the corporate sector? Well, very strange uh, uh, picture here that I took in the supermarket. Some decades ago, we only had a, one type of uh, peanut butter in the Netherlands. It was just made of peanut and some oil and uh, maybe some sugar was added. It was a very simple product. But nowadays, you can see so many flavors and so many brands. And as you know, this is the era of uh, caramel sea salt. So there's even caramel sea salt double uh, roasted uh, peanut butter available. So basically, we can learn a few things. We can sell the same peanut butter with different labels for a different price. And we can add value to the peanut butter. We can add some cheap ingredients and basically double the price. So that has to do with an economic uh, principle uh, that we need to know the value chain of our products and services. So what is the value we're going to add and we can ask money for and where does our market want to pay for? So that's very important. Then what can we learn from online services that are available? Because going online with e-learning uh, is very similar to uh, online uh, products that we use. Here you see the example from Dropbox. It's also like Google, uh, Google Drive. You can get uh, the basic stuff for free. And if you get convinced and uh, really want to know, uh, use extra features, then you're going to pay. So I'm a happy paid customer of uh, Dropbox and uh, I get all these extra uh, features and I pay um, uh, quite a nice fee every uh, year for that and uh, I'm willing to pay because I know what I get for that and I got teased uh, by the basic product so that's what you can do that's what we call a freemium business model so there's a value chain but you start with a free product that could be our uh, open uh, education materials and then what can we learn from the open source business model as you might know, I'm quite active in the QGIS uh, community, which is a beautiful community to, uh, to work with. Uh, and uh, the main thing is that we don't compete with uh, the product itself. So the product has a very high value, so the QGIS uh, GIS software, um, but it doesn't have a monetary value for us. Because everybody who works around in this community uh, does a job with it. So you either sell your services, for, for people who need help with QGIS, or you sell courses, or uh, even if you uh, sell, uh, if you have free courses in it, there can be uh, revenues from that. I'll come to that with the value chain. And um, there are companies who want improvements. They want uh, maybe plugins developed, so you can agree that that goes then back to the to the community and it becomes available for every user of uh, QGIS. Um, so in that way, we can improve the software, incre increase the amount of users and build this very nice community where you can also become a part of. So basically this means, and now I'm going to disappoint a lot of our educators here in the virtual uh, room. Uh, sorry, your uh, educational material is very valuable, but doesn't have monetary value. 
but what we do sell is the experience so this is the good news you are the added value because you provide the experience as a, as a known or renowned expert and uh, the way you teach is added value so basically that becomes our value chain I'm going to present a nice uh, case study and uh, it's a nice coincidence that today also nat uh, National Water of uh, uh, Uganda is visiting us and they were uh, a basis of this case study because in 2015 I uh, was developing a tailor-made training for National Water in Uganda uh, in cooperation with uh, Fitens Avidas International and uh, we agreed with all the stakeholders to publish um, the uh, materials as open courseware on our open courseware website of IHE and uh, they all agreed with that and that was great because that was the starting point for me to uh, record all the lectures and put it on a YouTube channel and embed it in uh, eCampus that's our uh, online uh, platform based on Moodle also open source and uh, also to uh, record all the exercises and publish it there and then uh, it gained momentum and uh, here uh, we are celebrating uh, today our seven years of uh, the OpenCourseWare website. If you haven't looked at it, uh, please take a look. It's on ocw.un-ihc.org. Uh, we can also post it in the chat. And uh, at the end, we will have a nice surprise for you. There are some new uh, courses to be uh, announced. But there you will also find this nice uh, course uh, that had to start uh, with National Water. I hope many alumni from National Water are also here. So what's the benefit of that? I could reuse those course materials. So it, the origin is the tailor-made training and I could use it then back in our master modules. And nowadays I use it as uh, blended learning. So we maximize the time in class on the exercises. For the alumni, you know, there's always not enough time for, uh, for GIS classes. And uh, of course I'm passionate about it. So I want to, uh, to teach you everything. And now we found a way of combining this. So we do, um, teaching uh, the theory by uh, by the videos uh, that people can find on uh, on eCampus and uh, we do the practice in class we do quizzes with Kahoot and in that way we build up a very nice class and I also reuse these materials in short courses or even in tailor-made trainings because and that's my advice if you want to go this way is make your things modular so you can for different customers package the different uh, uh, modules and it uh, resulted in a few new uh, products. So uh, there's an online course, which is uh, on QGIS. That's a joint venture with uh, Newland Geo Information. It's a paid course, so next to the open courseware. Uh, but then as an added value that you can receive uh, the op official QGIS certificate and you get support. And there's this nice uh, book that Abraham already uh, mentioned, QGIS for Hydrological uh, Applications. Uh, by uh, Kurt Menke and, uh, and myself and uh, that's also the, the same course materials but then co uh, yeah, compiled in a very nice book uh, with the latest updates in it so I can recommend that nice thing for you to know is that when you buy the book um, the, uh, my uh, share of the book goes to uh, a fund here hosted here at IHE to, pour, to support uh, participants from the global south to join me in uh, QGIS uh, hackfests and in Phosphor-G events, because we have a lack of, uh, especially female from the Global South in this open source community. We've got some uh, remarks on social media that there are only men from Europe of my age uh, on the pictures. So I really want to make a change in that. So if you buy the book, you really can help with uh, filling my fund and see some IHE uh, participants joining this and spread the word of uh, the open source community in, uh, in the rest of the world. This brings me to uh, probably the most important slide of this uh, webinar, uh, where we where I worked out the value chain. And what we see here is on the x-axis we see the price of a product. We don't really need to defi define that further. It can also be the income for the institute or the tuition fee or whatever. And on the y-axis we see the number of participants. And of course, with open courseware or MOOCs, open educational resources. Um, the number of participants is very high. This is relative uh, and because everybody can follow it for, for free. So the price is zero. Then the next step is uh, with uh, similar materials, we can uh, produce a, a book where people just pay a fixed amount, but they don't get support. They don't get face-to-face uh, -face experience and they don't get a certificate. Now, some people want support and a certificate so they can go for the online course. 
uh, we are developing now also uh, a new online course uh, on uh, the same as uh, as the book, so completely for QGIS for hydrological applications, uh, where you can get support and this official certificate will be ready in a few months, hopefully. Then some people want face-to-face uh, -face, uh, training and IHE experience, come to Delft, and uh, I know the uh, alumni now get a, a bit of a warm feeling, and we also want that many people can do that, uh, but it comes at a cost, so much uh, less people can do that, and uh, you need uh, probably also scholarships to do that. Um, so therefore we offer our face-to-face uh, -face short courses here at IHE Delft. It's the same material, but then face-to-face. Uh, -face. Then we come at the tailor-made trainings where we uh, can give specific uh, parts of those materials to our target group, but also develop more materials. So there's again what I uh, said before, where the innovation comes in and you develop the new innovative materials. And um, then we can use the same stuff in our MSC. So all these materials feed back and that makes this model a bit circular to, uh, to the different products. And again, it all starts with innovation and being cutting edge. I try to renew all my materials every few months. That's not for every topic, of course, the case, but it's important that we are not teaching 20 years the same material. So this brings me then to the freemium uh, uh, model uh, that I use then for my GIS classes. So if you can see in this table is that in all the modalities, open courseware, online course, short course, and tailor-made trainings, the course materials are available. There's no change. There's even in the free products you get that because it has no monetary value. Then with the online course and the short course, you get a tutor. For tailor-made trainings, you can even choose for tailor-made online trainings, which would be a great modality that uh, we don't see much yet, but it's increasing. The official QGIS certificate, uh, you can get that with the online course or the short course, and you can opt for it in the tailor-made trainings. Well, etc. You can uh, read this uh, table and you, you see how this uh, works. Um, and of course, the tailor-made trainings are very flexible. So the impact of this business model was that I uh, got a few new customers. So many people know me from the open materials, from the YouTube channel, from social media. And uh, this brings nice uh, customers. And I'm very happy that uh, Van Oort, uh, one of the biggest dredging companies in the world, wanted a QGIS training. Also nice to know that they use QGIS. They were silver sponsor also in that time. And they're sponsoring now the Dutch, uh, the first Dutch Hackfest that we uh, have in, uh, for QGIS in uh, in this month, in, in a week. Um, so I helped them to develop uh, QGIS course materials, which was more targeting offshore. And uh, it was really nice for me to develop that uh, together with them. And for uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, we organized trainings together with ELEAF on uh, crop mapping uh, for the MENA region using QGIS, of course. And we see a big increase in uh, short course participants and self-payers. My personal target was to beat, of course, the non-open source GIS course of my colleague. And I, uh, I'm happy to say that we easily uh, reached that uh, target. Now, these webinars should also not be underestimated. We see now uh, 94 participants on the screen, and that's uh, very nice. I recently had one uh, in cooperation with the Australian Water School, which was a very nice opportunity. We talked about QGIS for uh, hydrological applications. And um, yeah, there uh, after uh, the webinar, they produced this nice map with where the participants uh, who registered come from. Of course, much less joined, but still, I think we had about uh, four to 500 participants. But we see we really covered almost the whole globe. And uh, that's your market potential. And if we could have this widespread with uh, our uh, courses, then yeah, we really can increase our impact. It's also very important to monitor that. I'll come to that later. Let's talk a little bit about challenges. We need to be aware about intellectual property rights and uh, clauses in contracts or letters of agreements. I hashed out here uh, some experience that I, I had here and which undermines our business model. Because if you want to do this business model that I explained, you also need to get agreements with your donors and customers on what you can do with the materials. And if I want to have the CC BY and C license, but allow IHE uh, ourselves to still commercialize the products, then the text that is here on the screen uh, does not uh, help. And in fact, we cannot uh, use it ourselves. So in summary, this text says that everything we made for this customer becomes property of the customer. So you lose your intellectual property. 
other challenges. Of course, your organization, your colleagues need to be aware of the business model, of a viable business model. And uh, of course, we can have in the strategy that we need to do more online, but the colleagues will not move if they don't know why we do this and uh, what the business model is. So it's an incentive for your colleagues to make more uh, e-learning if they know why. And uh, transition always needs uh, flexibility of the, the organization. Very important, you will uh, bump into a lot of um, uh, probably rules and regulations that are not promoting e-learning but go against it. We know from some of our uh, cooperation projects that a certain percentage in some universities can only be online. So uh, normally these procedures are a bit outdated and we need uh, 21st century uh, procedures and rules. Investments needed to be ahead of the market, that's important. So if you feel that customers can steal your intellectual property if you want to uh, develop your course materials, then you better develop it before the customer can do that. So you sell the product that was already uh, done. I did that for uh, for QGIS with, uh, um, with the materials around the app, the input app and the merchant plugin. It's a very nice uh, tool which uses your QGIS project you can make uh, an app that you can use in the field all for free open source and uh, we were the first ones of course uh, developing the materials there and you can find it on gisopencourseware.org where all the gis open courseware from ihe is uh, hosted um, and we hope of course that customers want trainings in that and then we can sell uh, the experience instead of uh, the product Another challenge is we do not do enough monitoring and evaluation to measure the impact of e-learning and to confirm the business model. So it's very important to have a good framework for that uh, in place. And I'm going to show you a little bit about that. And uh, what is worrying me a lot, and I hope some donors will uh, watch this webinar or later on the video is, uh, come on, this is a great opportunity. We need not only the Orange Knowledge Program where many people uh, here uh, got scholarships from to have face-to-face -face trainings, but we need a green knowledge program. And with little money, we can support a lot of uh, people who want to learn things, especially from the global south. The most emails I got from my uh, online course was that it was too expensive, but the rates are very cheap for uh, uh, for Europe and for United States, for example. But uh, I can imagine that for the global south, uh, that's very very difficult. So probably using different tariffs, but also providing scholarships. And I think even individuals who want to uh, support or adopt an e-learning student can uh, just make uh, a contribution there because that's not expensive. Let's have a look at the monitoring and evaluation. So as said, we are running our uh, IHE Open Courseware now for seven years. And uh, here we see the statistics uh, for where our customers come from and uh, who use the open courseware, so the free materials, and uh, most come from uh, Asia and Africa. So that's nice. That's also uh, very much representative for our face-to-face -face, uh, classes that we give. But uh, although it's accessible for the whole world, we see most participants come from those uh, places. Uh, this comes from uh, Google Analytics. And well, as a GIS person, I had to modify a little bit the map because it uses uh, the Mercator projection, uh, which uh, <laughs> gives a bit of a bias towards the, the countries that are in a, uh, uh, close to the North and the South Pole. And we don't want that, of course. So. Then uh, these are the statistics for uh, the last year, for this year, the last 365 days. And uh, very nice to monitor that and to find out uh, what the peaks mean, thanks to our uh, colleague uh, Jipke from the Education Bureau. Uh, we find here two peaks. And this first peak was generated by the Afri Alliance MOOC, where many, hopefully, of you already uh, participated in. And um, there's a second peak here. That was when I had the webinar with the Australian Water School. And this generated, of course, a big uh, load on our uh, OpenCourseWare website. And we hope that many people who join these webinars uh, follow these uh, online courses and the OpenCourseWare. And this is a proof that. Yeah, it's also really a good marketing tool because you get interest in this. Another uh, important uh, 21st century skill is to use social media and e-learning is very uh, adapted to that. So you can easily link your open educational resources. So open educational resources are small um, 
products like a little video of a few minutes or a very short uh, uh, yeah, materials that you want to put out there on the internet, you can easily embed that in your social media tweets or uh, put it on Instagram and uh, then you can attract a lot of potential uh, clients and of course you hope in your business model that people will not only use the free stuff but also go to the paid um, products uh, because they get added value like support and uh, uh, the, the diploma. And we should also realize, and we see it a lot of in the discussions here with lecturers, that yeah, we don't realize that we are now teaching to the millennials. And these millennials are very uh, different than uh, previous generations. They are used to watch uh, short videos. Their tension line is much lower than the 45 minutes uh, that we have in class. So maximum five minutes, uh, which is very hard for lecturers, but you have to cut it in pieces. And they watch it on their phone while they're uh, multitasking with Netflix and other activities. So yeah, we really should um, fit to that lifestyle and offer our course materials in that format. And it's a great opportunity for us to pub publish these short videos on social media, on Twitter and LinkedIn, and uh, YouTube even has community channels, so, so use that. Then what's in it for you as a lecturer? Well, you get a lot of dopamine from that. So I am uh, enough... Uh, motivated to make uh, more videos if I'm not too busy with my uh, my regular job because you get uh, a lot of compliments on internet on your on your product so people call it here a lifesaver or the best material they've seen well that's of course what you want and that's also what your employer wants to see and uh, you can tweet about it and you see that uh, many people uh, yeah respond to those tweets or, or like it and we can get all the metrics also from Twitter and that encourages us to even promote it more and uh, yeah, for this webinar, I, uh, uh, for the uh, Australian Water School, I made this little video with an overview of our course offerings, especially the open ones. And uh, yeah, more than uh, five and a half thousand people uh, viewed uh, this post on LinkedIn. So that's, uh, that's also very helpful. So I want to come uh, to conclusions before we go to the discussions. What is very important, if you are at the, uh, the moment thinking of developing e-learning, uh, is that you need to define your objectives. So what is the impact you want to achieve? So why do you want to do this? What are your target groups? What is the efficiency that you want to achieve, uh, etc. things that we discussed. You have to define the value chain of your course materials, products and services. What do you want to give for free? What do you want to have paid customers for? Are they willing to pay? And how do your colleagues look at that? You need to internalize that. And you have to develop the uh, business model really take time for that because you can only get your organization so far if the business model makes sense. That also means that you need to establish a monitoring and evaluation framework to see if it really works like you think it works. Uh, there is in this presentation a lot of uh, assumptions from my side and uh, yeah, we just have to measure these things and learn from you if, it's, if it works like that. Then you need to do marketing, also don't underestimate that. You need to work on change management. You will uh, meet a lot of uh, resistance uh, maybe in your organization uh, where things are not uh, up to date, your protocols are not up to date, and you need to uh, work on that together. And again, scholarships are needed. So my uh, great uh, request to uh, donors who are watching this or uh, private people who have, uh, uh, have money to support students, we need a green knowledge program where we can uh, support many more participants to, uh, to follow uh, these classes, even for a diploma online. Now the surprise of the day is uh, because we celebrate the seven years uh, open courseware at uh, IHE Delft. If you would go now to the website, we have a few new courses that I want to announce today. There is a, a new one on uh, irrigation management and development. There's a new one on delta planning and management and there's one on uh, experimental uh, methods, which is in Spanish. There's an ebook, and English is also available. So uh, I hope uh, this will be very useful for you, and uh, I hope you will follow us and you'll see the new things that are posted all the time. And uh, if you have ideas, then we also like to hear that from you. Um, so that's uh, also the, the, the last question. Maybe Abraham can, can uh, put that up before we start uh, the discussion is, uh, yeah, what would you like to see as uh, uh, open courseware on our uh, platform? With this uh, 
final question, I would like to open the, uh, the floor for a discussion. There were already some questions uh, posted here, and I give the floor to Abraham. Maybe you can moderate this. Thank you yes. for your uh, attention. Uh, thank you so much, Hans, for that uh, great presentation. Um, we are going to pivot to um, questions. And I'll put up the first question online here uh, on the uh, interface here, which uh, we received by email from uh, Ban Mali, who um, asks that one shortcoming of conventional educational material is language. And for those of whom English is not the first language, we struggle to benefit from books, papers, and lectures in English. <coughs> Excuse me. Will this problem persist with open education, or is there greater possibility of multilingual higher education with uh, open uh, education processes and tools? Yeah, thank you for this very uh, nice question. Uh, maybe uh, some of you know that I uh, I'm also specialized in the francophone uh, part of the world and. Uh, have been doing there uh, a lot of project work. We always tried to uh, to ask donors to uh, and, and pro programs there to convert our English materials to French. There seems not to be much uh, interest for that from that side, but we still have to put on the pressure there. But in e-learning, especially, there's an opportunity because you can run these in parallel in multiple languages. Uh, well, face to face, you are bound to uh, yeah the majority of the group that you have in the in the class. So we are working on it, and maybe a nice other uh, surprise for you is that we are working currently on translating the uh, QGIS materials uh, to French with an alumnus of us. Uh, he is in Algeria now, uh, working on that together with me, so that will become uh, available. So there's also a role that you can uh, take up there to, if you think that um, your target group is interested in another language of the materials, uh, we have a DOPC2 program of developing e-learning materials together with our partners. So you could uh, write a proposal. I'm coordinating that part, so uh, you can contact me and then I can explain you how we can uh, proceed. Mm -hmm. um, I will next put up a comment by Brian Reed, who says, let me increase the font size to a more readable level. One challenge is uh, uh, pedagogy, teaching science. Books are fine for facts, and face-to-face -face is good for developing critical thinking. E-learning is, is, is much harder to use for deep learning, says Brian Reed. How would you respond to that? Um, yes, uh, that is indeed a case where we have to carefully look at in the design of our e-learning. Um, in my observation, it's not always the case. It depends on how you do the e-learning. So with the QGIS class of, uh, of this year, we used the blended learning again, and uh, I used the book in class. And um, I found contrary to the expectations that critical thinking was not improved. Because uh, people expect when there's a lecture in the room that they get instructions. And uh, therefore, I'm thinking of moving it to completely e-learning. Uh, with only some contact hours where we try to work on the critical thinking. So basically, people figure out themselves with the tools that are available online, uh, like Google and like uh, other uh, like papers they can read about the topic, to figure out themselves how things work. And then we have face-to-face -face sessions, which are not about instructions, but about discussion and helping uh, each other out when there's uh, problems with uh, the course materials. In the e-learning platforms themselves, you uh, can introduce quizzes and also the way of do, dealing with the assignments uh, can be uh, different. Uh, so I would say, yeah, with GIS, you still have to submit uh, um, a map uh, and uh, an explanation of what we can see on the map and a discussion, uh, maybe a, a report. So there are different ways of mixing e-learning with uh, uh, the traditional ways. But uh, And there's also teamwork is possible in e-learning platforms. But I agree, this is something of concern for the, the quality, but not necessary that uh, e-learning per se reduces that critical thinking. Mm -hmm. The next question is from uh, Jean-Marc. It comes from Twitter. Uh, he asks if uh, open education is equivalent to online. Uh, what would open education processes that are not online look like? Mm, interesting question. I have not uh, thought about that. In my uh, definitions and what I know, it's always online because people can easily access that. 
probably if you uh, provide free materials on a on a DVD or uh, as a as a free book, a hard copy, then it becomes also uh, open education. So yeah, I'm not sure what uh, uh, what is uh, meant here or what thoughts are about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We hope that Sean Mark responds to us uh, um, with a follow up in course of our discussion. We look forward to that. Question from Ujwal is, <coughs> excuse me, I have a cough. Uh, Hans, for your online course, uh, what is the mode of interaction with the tutor? Yes, that's a good one. Um, there's two sides to that. Uh, in an online course, the participant wants uh, support uh, probably 24 hours per day uh, when uh, uh, to contact the lecturer to have help on the other hand from the lecturer's side we need to uh, budget these things we need to uh, deal in the organization that uh, that there's a time writing for that at IHG we write time so how much do you allocate for your support so from the lecturer's point of view you want to keep it to a minimum without disturbing the learning process of the lecture so what we do is set up frequently asked questions uh, or forum fora on the platforms where people can read previously asked questions. Most of the questions I receive for QGIS in the online learning are questions that are already asked. I would say 99.9%. .9%. So the answer can be easily copied from previous emails or other resources. Um, there are uh, modes of operation where you use a virtual classroom. I personally have uh, not yet experienced with that, but I like that if I'm going more uh, maybe with the IHC students to uh, the learning experience where they do more online, where we can have some moments in virtual classrooms to uh, discuss things. There are probably more possibilities, but this is what, uh, what I know of. Mm -hmm. uh, Simainga from Zambia is working in the water sector in the area of hydropower planning and also in the energy sector as renewable energy co coordinator. Uh, so her, uh, their question is, do you have a schedule of online lectures that are planned already so that I can share it with my uh, colleagues uh, in my organization? Yes, IHG Delft has a, a page on our website if you go to education and uh, then you will find online uh, courses and under that you find a list um, with all the descriptions and when they take place. <clears throat> for my QGIS course uh, it's a bit different, it's not in that list for some procedural uh, reasons that we hope to solve soon, but um, that one also is different in the sense that it has a continuous uh, subscription, so anytime you want to subscribe you stay two months in the system but it doesn't have a fixed uh, start and end uh, period because I think it uh, makes sense also to have these things more flexible for our users. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is from Branislav who asks if there are any courses or books on QGIS implementation for freshwater biodiversity research. That's an interesting one. Yeah, not that I uh, know of. Uh, I, I since I published my book, I got in touch with some other lecturers uh, from other institutions who also got a lot of ideas of thematic QGIS recipe books. Uh, you, you can understand that such a book on uh, QGIS for uh, hydrological applications is a niche. You, of course, are all people from the water sector, but many people in the world are not. So uh, more generic QGIS books like uh, the book from Kurt Menke himself, uh, Discover QGIS, uh, has a much wider uh, use. But uh, I'm, I'm sure that there is uh, interest in uh, thematic books. So if you have a good uh, proposal for that or need help, then uh, yeah, I can always be available to co-author or review or, or help you with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so the next one, Hans, is a compliment. And uh, you mentioned that something that keeps you going, something that keeps you sort of motivated to keep uploading stuff on YouTube is, uh, is feedback and compliments. And from... Uh, do do uh, ba who says uh, he is a student in environmental modeling at CZU. Uh, thanks to Dr. Hans's tutorials, he was able to perform one of the most important tasks of his thesis, which is catchment delineation for hydrological modeling. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Dudu, for your uh, for your remark. Uh, I, I know you already also through uh, Twitter and and your questions there, and uh, you will be coming here. Uh, uh, soon for an internship so we can collaborate further. So this is a nice example of people who know me from uh, the open courseware, use the tutorials, interact through social media and uh, yeah, then end up at IHC doing an internship for uh, yeah, learning more. Mm -hmm. The next uh, comment is from Maria 
who says most online seminars are advertising for a specific project without critical pro and contra knowledge exchange. Often no neutral overview of different methods or practices is shown. How can more knowledge exchange be promoted? Yeah, that's a good one. I, uh, I agree with you that this should be done uh, more. So online seminars should be a two way. So always should include this part where we have uh, question and discussion in, in this format. We, uh, we have half an hour for that. I think that's a very decent and most often it's not the case. Uh, so that should be always a part of it. I think there should always be some uh, some questions like we also did today where we interact with the audience. Uh, during uh, online seminars and webinars, there's limited, limited time for that. But if you have more online courses with these virtual classrooms, you can have more knowledge exchange. You should also do more peer learning. I also hope to learn from the participants of these uh, webinars to get new ideas. There are already some questions that I have never thought of that were ever asked. So. There's definitely space for that, but we need to provide that space and be conscious about that. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is a very specific one. It's from Ramudi, who asks if there are any webinars around on uh, PC Raster. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Yeah, PC Raster. That's a, that's yeah. a good one. Um, today, a new version of PC Raster came out for... Uh, 4.3.0 and uh, I was immediately thinking if I wouldn't have had this webinar today I would have a new video on how to install it. Um, webinars on that, there's also a person who was here for uh, um, an internship in summer and was working on uh, with PC Rust on the thesis and yesterday told me let's make a, a webinar on this so it will come. Uh, we are working out uh, the details, so uh, they will be there for sure. I'm increasing also the video content on PC Raster on my uh, YouTube channel, so I'll keep you posted. Uh, the next question is from Khaled. I'll just increase the font size of it so we can all uh, read it. Khaled asks, uh, Khaled is from the UAE National Water Center, and uh, he has a question about using satellite data and processing this data. Uh, such as GRACE and GRACE FO. It seems a, a lot of research recently focuses on using GRACE. Do you uh, think there will be courses explaining the interactive use between GRACE and QGIS? Well, it's a, it's a, a question of uh, demand and supply here, very economic principle. So if you would look at questions asked in my YouTube channel, for example, you will see that uh, many people propose to me uh, to make <laughs> courses on topics. But yeah, I also have a job and a life uh, next to my YouTube channel. So we cannot offer all these things that are uh, demanded. And if you uh, see the value chain uh, curve that I, I showed you before, it all starts with where uh, the resources enter the system. So if there is enough demand, and then I can make it. If it's a, a hobby, and if I really feel like I, I can do that, then I would do it myself. So basically, requests for certain things, uh, that's also in the open source world in general, that's your least chance that these things happen. Your higher chance is to engage, start a project, look for resources together and cooperate, and then uh, we can make this. Okay. Okay, I think with that we have reached the end of the, <coughs> excuse me again. <clears throat> we have reached the end of the questions and comments. Um, thanks a lot, Hans, for your great presentation. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining in for, and for your great questions and comments. Uh, first of all, thanks, Hans, for pointing out that I made the mistake of using the terms uh, open education and open source education interchangeably. I understand now uh, that open source pertains to code, uh, and we should be careful about which term to use where, open source, open data, and open education. Uh, I will not attempt to summarize the discussion here in real time, but uh, I would like to share with you that my takeaway is that the education sector, or uh, to put it more plainly, the process of teaching and learning, is set to change in profound ways in the coming years. And uh, it is great that some of the leading um, educational organizations such as IHE, apart from several others, do recognize this and are spearheading this change. They are trying to be part of this change rather than uh, resisting it. And I think that's very important um, that uh, institutions are doing it apart from highly motivated individuals such as Hans. And um, so uh, thanks a lot. This is perhaps a good point to mention that the next webinar will be on the topic of desalinization and will take place in April or July. And after that, there'll also be a webinar in May so please follow the following links. I will just put them up in the chat box. 
to stay updated as uh, the topics, the speakers, and the timings are finalized. So, and also on these links, you will find a recording of uh, the webinar from today, this webinar. Uh, it should be up at some point tomorrow uh, uh, at the latest. And um, um, yeah, thank you all for joining in. Thanks, uh, Hans, again. Thank you, Abraham. And also thanks to the whole team uh, that made this uh, possible, including uh, Maria, who uh, invited all the alumni, and uh, uh, Jipke and uh, Raquel from the Education Bureau, and uh, Wim Glas for facilitation here. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Bye-bye.